Hey guys, and welcome to Petrol Ped. Now then, would you believe it is nearly two months since I collected my latest Hendy long-termer, the Renault Akana that is parked behind me. In that two months, I have been super busy with lots of trips away. And although the car has only appeared on the channel once, that doesn't mean to say it hasn't been driven and I haven't got under its skin and I haven't got lots and lots to talk to you about. But sadly, just being busy means that it's taken me two months to do this, my first impressions video. <laughs> but the good news is that means there's loads to talk about. Now, before we carry on, make sure you hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. We are rapidly approaching 150,000 subscribers. Very, very exciting number. So if you haven't subscribed already, hit that button. And if you wanted some nice Petroped merch, over the summer, then head on over to Legacy Legends. There is a link in the description below. I've got a range of t-shirts, stickers, and a couple of very, very cool mugs. But enough of that for now. We've got much to discuss about the Renault Arcana. Yep. It's safe to say that the last couple of months for me have been very, very busy. And you haven't seen this car on the channel a great deal, and that's much to do with the demise of my JCW Clubman, the arrival of my new Porsche. I've had trips away to Italy to visit Ferrari and Pagani. I was on tour for over a week and a half with GT Tours in the Pyrenees and the Alps, and lots of other content. So although this car hasn't appeared on the channel, in the behind the scenes, if you like, it's been helping me get to my various locations. If you saw my Nichols N1A video, it did make an appearance as we arrived at the location for filming. So I have driven it quite a bit. Mrs. Petroped has driven it a lot as well. And we've started to formulate our opinion of the car. What I'm going to do with this video is kind of break it into two halves, because tomorrow, I've got a pretty big journey I need to do in the car, and I thought it would be useful to use that journey as a backdrop to talk about what this car's like to drive, and with it being a hybrid, what kind of economy and, and if you like, performance you're gonna get from the car. So we'll do all of that tomorrow. The first half of the video, I want to talk about the aesthetics, the practicality, and so on. So, so let's talk about aesthetics, because I think for this car, the aesthetics are its strong point, and, and that's helped a great deal by the paintwork that this particular car is in. This is called Flame Red Metallic, and it is beautiful. It's a stunningly deep metallic color. It's gonna be super difficult for me to get that on camera. I will do my best, but I think of all the Hendy cars I've had so far, this is the one that's had the most compliments, the most comments. People wanna know what it is. It's not a particularly common car on the road in the UK currently, and I think set off in this paintwork, and then this is the RS line trim, so it's got really nice red accents. The anthracite wheels have a little bit of a red accent on them just to set the car off externally. And then when we jump on the inside, you'll see it's a really nice spec on the inside. However, and, and there is a big however, this car has the looks of a high performance fast car, but it doesn't necessarily deliver that in terms of driving experience. It's definitely, if you like, a sheep in wolf's clothing. And I think that's a great shame but I'll get onto that very shortly. But as I said, styling wise, I really, really like the car. It's grown on me a great deal. When it's clean and it's polished like it is now, I just think it looks absolutely stunning and helped by it being one of the hottest days of the year so far. Let's talk practicality and styling at the rear of the car. So yeah, <laughs> now, before we carry on about the styling, have a slight problem with this car. It's not the first Renault to do it either. I'm just gonna walk out of frame and just listen very carefully for what happens. Did you hear that? And it's just done it again. It opens itself or locks and closes itself because the car doesn't have a key. It has this, it's like a big fat Renault credit card. It's got an open button on it, but as long as this is on you in your pocket, whenever you get close to the car, it unlocks itself. And then when you walk away, it locks itself back up again. Now I know, I think I can go into the settings and disable that feature, but it just means that when you're washing the car and you've got the key in the pocket and you're walking around, it's constantly locking and unlocking itself. Now, rear styling. 
I'm going to call this a kind of crossover coupe style, and I really like it. It reminds me a great deal of the Mercedes GLC coupe from the angle that you're looking at there. I really think it's a handsome looking car. Has a couple of things I'm not that keen on, one of which is this. So you look at this and go, oh, look, it's got two lovely, nice exhaust pipes. No, it doesn't. These are just plastic bits of trim. I understand why it's there. I would just rather accept the fact this is a hybrid with a small petrol engine. It doesn't need two exhaust pipes. Don't put them on. Or if you're going to put them on, just put a real one on. Don't put plastic. And I know it's maybe it's part of the RS line trim to make it look like a sportier car, but they're not exhaust pipes. And everybody who has any ounce of car in them knows that they're not as soon as they see it. I just don't like them at all. But that's me being particularly grumbly and particularly picky. Maybe it's an old age thing. But yeah, the rest of the car from the back, styling wise, on point. Practicality wise, now you may well see the pups walking around, so I know that they're not in the boot, but can you get a bike in the boot? Well, I can answer that question because I already have a bike in the boot. My posh bike. Now, partial shelf had to come out and because I've got quite a big frame and I've got both the wheels still on the bike, the passenger seat is pushed a little bit forward just to make enough space. If the passenger seat is back, there was literally, it was long, too long by about three inches and the tailgate wouldn't shut. But I have got a bike in the boot. Obviously we can get it out without damaging the bike or the car. Here you go. So yeah, let me just place this slightly off of camera and we'll put the seats up because I want to have a quick look in the back at what the passenger space is like. We'll close this down. Yeah, we'll pop this one up and then, oh. Now that I let you into secret, this is actually the first time I've sat in the back of this. <laughs> so, normal drill, this seat is in a position ready for me to drive, so it's quite a long way back. I don't have massive amounts of leg room. My legs are kind of splayed either side of the rear seat. Uh, clearly, if you had a slightly le less leggy driver, you might have a bit more room. Headroom isn't too bad. And then these seats aren't actually too bad. They, they feel quite comfortable. It's just a really lovely spec in here. It just feels very, very special with the, with the red stitching and the leather and Alcantara trim. You've got lovely bits of carbon fiber detailing on the door panels, leather on the door cards themselves. It's just beautiful. Personally, I'd um, have a pan roof. It's just a little bit dark in here. I think a pan roof would open it up slightly. Let's jump in the driver's seat. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about some of the gadgets and gizmos up there. It's a really very nice interior in this car. In fact, I'd go as far to say it's one of the nicest, sportiest feeling interiors I've sat in for a long time. You've got a little place to put your big fat Renault credit card just there. But yeah, so first things first, choice of materials in here. Seat wise, I've mentioned them a number of times. I'm a big fan. Leather and Alcantara mix, red contrast stitching. I love these headrests, very kind of Volvo-esque. Steering wheel, really nice feel to it. Lovely leather clad steering wheel, Renault Sport logo just there to make you feel special. And then you look around and you've got a carbon fiber detailing on the dash, on the doors. Um, it's just really, really smart in here. Uh, you look down at the pedals and you've got these kind of aluminium sporty pedals and that's all this RS line. And one of the things I said on the collection is I find it so sad that Renault no longer make hot versions of their cars. The RS moniker is now just a trim level, not a sports enhancement to a vehicle. And I find that really, really sad because actually this car is crying out for a hot version, a kind of almost like a, a, a Cupra Formentor version, a 300 horsepower one of these would be a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. But let's talk more about that when we're out and about driving. But certainly the feeling you get in here is, is really special. 
There's not a massive amount of buttons. Let me just start the car. Now, it is a hybrid. It's actually gone straight into EV rather than firing up the petrol engine. Um, your main screen here, I actually quite like, I'm not a big fan of screen sticking out the dash, but I actually quite like the fact that it's portrait rather than landscape. Um, and that's really cool because when you start pairing your phone with Apple CarPlay, it's the first example of any kind of uh, car manufacturer that has laid out Apple CarPlay in a different way. Rather than it being landscape, it's portrait. And, it, and it's, it's really cool. It just makes it feel a little bit different. You do have an EV button to force the car into EV. This is a hybrid and not a plug-in hybrid. So although it will run as an electric car, it will only do that under certain limited conditions. So typically uh, under kind of creeping traffic, maneuvering, maneuvering around a car park, that kind of thing. As soon as you kind of push the accelerator and want to go at any speed, it instantly kicks into being a hybrid and it's powered by the petrol engine and the electric motor is there for assistance and economy and, and performance and so on. So it doesn't really have any EV only driving of any great amount. You've got a number of different drive modes in here, My Sense, Sport and Eco. I'll talk more about those when you're out and about on the road. My plan for the journey tomorrow, I've got, you know, I've got to drive up to Millbrook Proving Ground tomorrow. So the idea is I thought on one way I would do an economy test and the other way I put it in sport and do a sports test and kind of talk you through the two uh, driver experiences of those. But for me, this car, so far, it, it's ticking lots of boxes. I think it looks great. The, the color looks nice. I like the styling. It's practical. The interior, I love the interior. It's a really nice, sporty place to be. However, the opinions I form on the car also need to include the driving. So tomorrow, we're going to get in the car. We've got a couple of hours drive each way, and I can talk you through my impressions so far on the Renault Okana once you start driving. <sighs> Morning. <laughs> it is Sparrows. Yeah, it's 26 minutes past six. Um, I am on my way. Now the joys of filming in the summertime is we've got really long days, so it's nice and light even early in the morning. So I can get some filming done of the journey there. Um, I've got a journey of 108 miles. Now it is mostly dual carriageway and motorway. I'm going up to Bedford to the Milford Proving Grounds to shake down and hopefully test drive a car that I may well be driving a festival of speed, but it's a bit scary. Anyway, I might tell you a bit more about that a bit later on. Uh, I've zeroed the trips and I'm gonna do this journey in my sense. This is the default start mode. When the car starts, it goes into my sense and I'm just going to drive relatively normally and see how we get on, see what the MPG is on a journey of 108 uh, miles. Then on the way back, I might do a little bit more spirited driving. It's a 1.6 litre petrol engine. It's got a hybrid drivetrain attached to it. My, my issue I have with the car is just a basic lack of power. Now, that's not evident when you are driving to the shops when you're doing city driving and you're kind of mooching around it's actually you don't need lots of power then and the argument and I guess the argument behind the design ethos of this car is you don't need a lot of power so we won't give it to you so the car weighs a bit less it costs a bit less uh, and it's more efficient on fuel and that's absolutely fine if you're going to buy this car and do lots and lots of city driving my challenge with it is I want to buy this car and yes I do lots of local journeys and city driving but I also when I get onto a nice bit of B road want to stretch its legs a little bit and as soon as you start to do that for me this car the engine just starts to strain a little bit now it's got a very similar characteristic to the RAV4 hybrid that I had with the um, high revving engine to maximize the efficiency of the engine and the power cycle that comes from the engine unfortunately in this car it does it to an extent that Sometimes you think the engine is literally gonna rip itself out of its mountings and come through the bonnet. And I don't like that very much. Um, and that's why I think for this car, I would just want just another 50 horsepower or 100 horsepower that would just give it a little bit more of the sporty driving nature that the looks think you're gonna get when you see it from a distance or when you sit in the driver's seat and look out over the steering wheel. 
Anyway, I've got an hour and 50 minutes, so let's crack on with the uh, fuel consumption test. Enjoy this beautiful morning, and I'll speak to you in a bit. Well, I am just coming up to four miles away from my destination. I need to get this bit of filming done before I get to Millbrook because no cameras are allowed off Millbrook and I'll have to take them um, out of the car. Um, but really, really interesting. So I basically sat on the A3 and the M25 um, with the cruise control set to 70 miles an hour. The traffic's been really good. And I've done just over 100 miles uh, and I've averaged about 57 and a half miles per hour and my fuel consumption is 57.3 miles per gallon and I think that is pretty impressive because I'm pretty sure that had I set my cruise control at 60 or 65 it would be a little bit better than that and for me that's the strength of this smaller engine hybrid package is that on a longer journey, this is a, a relatively bulky, you know, relatively big car, compact SUV size. And I think, you know, anything north of 55 miles to the gallon, especially in this current climate with such high fuel prices, it is pretty good. So on a longer journey, you get decent miles per gallon. And then on the shorter journeys where you get a little bit more assistance of EV running and those types of things, you know, my long-term trip on this car isn't dissimilar. It's that kind of, certainly north of 50 miles to the gallon. And I, I think that's really good. Really, really good. So, very nearly at Millbrook to test drive this amazing car. I'll tell you about that when I've finished. And then on the way back home, we'll put it into sport mode. Because this my sense, I'm, I'm not a big fan in terms of the way it feels to drive. It, it, it's a little bit dead to the throttle and then when you do push on it kind of the, the engine really does sound like it's straining so it is the default mode that you go into so on the way home we'll stick it in sport mode and we'll see what this car's like if you want to do a little bit more spirited driving talking about spirited driving that's definitely what you need to do when you get in the car I'm about to get into Oh, <laughs> that, that was a pretty special day. So I can now let you into the secret. Um, I've just been testing a 2012 Jeff Gordon NASCAR that I've been invited to drive at Festival of Speed. Uh, today was a shakedown. The owner has only had the car a couple of months and he'd never actually had the opportunity to drive it or start it. So today was about making sure the car started okay, there was no issues. Then the owner had uh, some runs, got used to it, and then I unbelievably, I was offered to get the opportunity to get behind the wheel. Um, I couldn't film any of it. We were at Millbrook Proving Ground, and if you've been to Millbrook or you've heard about it, it's basically a no camera on site at all. Um, so we had to have stickers over the lenses, even of our smartphones which was very very uh frustrating but make sure you tune in to my festival of speed coverage because i'll be driving it up the hill on friday at festival of speed all things going well uh, the car performed excellently a few minor little things that we need to sort out in time for next week but what an epic car i don't want to talk too much about the car I'll put a picture of it uh, over now just so you can see it but a thousand horsepower I mean the noise it made was unreal but thankfully it was actually relatively straightforward to drive which really surprised me I thought it would be very very tricky but it was actually pretty easy to drive anyway we need to now go into the main display and I'm going to go into sport mode I've reset the trip and we're going to head home um, and see what this car does terms of mpg and stuff on the way home and find a little bit of you know twisty b road a road type driving so that we can test the sporty credentials of the car certainly not going to be a comparison to the thing i've been driving all morning anyway i'll uh, i'll report back in when we get to some twisty stuff first up we've got lots of motorway and dual carriageway 
So we're nearly at the end of our dual carriageway motorway driving. Interestingly, there's been quite a lot of heavy traffic on the way back, so I've spent a lot of the time kind of creeping along at 40, 50 or 60 miles an hour. Yet the fuel economy is currently 48.2, so it's much less than it was on the way up there. And I guess that's no great surprise because I'm in sport mode. One of the things that you will feel as a characteristic when you are cruising in this in sport mode is the engine revs are just that much higher and I guess that's not it's not a great surprise really because a lot of cars in sport mode they'll they'll rev the engine or they'll hold on to the gears longer rather which typically makes the engine rev longer but this car now that's 70 miles an hour and the car's just it just feels like it needs to change up another gear it doesn't sit comfortably I'm not a big fan of having to go into this whole MMI screen to change the the settings I put it back into my sense and instantly the car's revs drop and it just feels a little bit more at home if you like but this is a sport test so back into sport mode back into uh, CarPlay yeah we're nearly home now okay finally on some twisty bits in sport mode now, I'm sure many people who buy this car probably never take it for a spirited drive down a B road, but I always want to know and feel like my car can do it if I want to. So let's take it up this road. Now, this what I love about this bit of road is it artificially creates, it's quite harsh on the car. I can feel what the car's like through a relatively quick but tight bend. There's quite a bit of body roll, tiny little bit of understeer. You can just feel a bit of weakness from the front end of the car. But actually, you can hear the cars high up in the rev range. There's no gearbox enable to enable you to, to change or interact with that gear change manually at all. You're entirely down to the mercy of what the car wants to do. And in sport mode, actually, it's it's not too bad. It's got a reasonable amount of punch, but it's just very high revving, like really high revving. And every now and again, it does that. So I wasn't changing my speed too much, but I just put a little bit more throttle. It's like a kick down in a in an auto box, and it just starts to rev the engine out and. I'm not a big fan of that. So for me, this car dynamically is a bit disappointing. On a longer run, it's fine when you sit on the motorway. It's actually better on the motorway in my sense than it is in sport. It just sits at a lower rev and is far, far more efficient. I mean, we're nearly 10 miles per gallon down compared to the run I did this morning. You can see it drop down again there. So, it's, it's frus it frustrates me, this car, because it has all the looks and it has the anticipation. You think it's going to be an amazingly dynamic car to drive, and, and it's not. What it is good at is, if you like, what I guess what most buyers would want. It's brilliant round town. It's quiet. It's economic. It's practical. It's comfortable. It looks nice all of the things that most people want from a car. And if that's what you want from the car, the Yakana's for you. However, if you want the sporty drive to match the sporty looks, I, it, it doesn't do that for me, unfortunately. And, it, and it's frustrating because as I said already, you know, another 50, maybe 100 horsepower in this car uh, would be incredible, absolutely incredible. Anyway, I'll carry on putting content um, about the car on my socials and I'm going to do another another video or two on it, I am sure. But let me know what you think of the Renault Akana. Anyway, for now, I'll love you and leave you. If you enjoyed that one, please give me a thumbs up. Comments below are always welcome. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Petrobed for plenty more content to come. And I'll see you on the next film. You take care, guys. Drive safe.